Boker Tov, San Diego, Erev Tov, a lot, and welcome to Friends of Israel Around the World. My name is Wayne Firestone. I'm the Executive Director of the America Israel Friendship League. We're really excited to bring you two world-class experts on the subject of water, Seth Siegel and Oded Distel. This is part of our Friends Indeed series that we've continued uh, twice a week since the beginning of the uh, pandemic. We're really excited to share in this conversation that we'll talk about the remarkable story of Israel transforming itself from a water-starved country to a water-exporting country. For everyone on this call, whether you're participating by Zoom or by Facebook, we would love to know where you're calling in from today. If you want to share with us a quick howdy and your location and maybe your favorite body of water that's near you that can uh, bring drinking water, um, regardless of what the technology is, please let us know in your chat box. For everyone that's joining us uh, uh, live today, you can send questions addressed to Seth or to Oded uh, throughout the broadcast, and we'll do our best to, to uh, uh, get those answered for you. For everybody that's on Facebook Live, you can turn on your watch party, and that means all your friends get to watch along with us, even though they should be at work right now. If they're not, they could join in and sneak in, uh, peek in our, our, our conversation here as well. Look, we're going to try to cover, uh, oh, we have someone calling in from Modine, a, a, a neighbor of Oded's, I guess. Uh, we will try to cover a lot of ground today. So uh, we're going to jump right into the conversation. Uh, Oded Distel is one of Israel's leading water experts with expertise both in the private and public sectors. He uh, served as the director of the Israel New Tech at the Ministry of Economy in 2007, has over 24 years of experience in government, and is now the CEO of Talia. Uh, which is finding smart solutions to water problems around the world. We'll hear a little bit more about that. Seth Siegel, a serial entrepreneur and water activist, author of the New York Times bestseller, Let There Be Water, the title that we borrowed for our webinar today with uh, uh, due credit to Seth. Um, this has been published in 18 different languages. Seth, you'll have to give us a feel of what this sounds like in some of those other languages. Over 50 countries around the world. Uh, he didn't retire after this book. Actually, he seems to have uh, uh, had more to drink and wrote another book about water. Uh, Troubled Water, What is Wrong with What We Drink? Uh, Seth, maybe your best title should be Chief Evangelist and Storyteller uh, for Israel's Water Story. Why are you still so passionate about this topic and where do you want to start the discussion today? Well, first of all, let's start by saying thank you to you, Wayne, and thank you to the uh, America-Israel Friendship League. Uh, the organization that does great work, uh, not only telling Israel's story, but sharing great values between the U.S. and Israel. Uh, America is a can-do country that never stops with a problem and never laments the fact that nothing can get better. We always try to strive to make things better in America. And for those who are familiar with Israel, I'm an American, I'm American born, raised, and have lived only in the United States my whole life, except for a brief period of time when I was a grad student overseas. Uh, anyone who has experienced Israel knows that likewise, Israel, which is a much younger country, has the same ethos. Um, I'll start by also saying another word, which is that although my book, Let There Be Water, and thank you for that nice introduction, although Let There Be Water is totally and completely uh, about um, uh, about the water story of Israel, I intended for it to be thought of as an alternative history of Israel. We generally think of histories of a country of their presidents or prime ministers, their generals, their wars and so forth, economic collapses, but we don't generally think of it in other terms like infrastructure. And yet in the case of Israel, this story of water infrastructure tells the story of Israel. It also does one other thing. It tells about how the Israeli psyche, it talks about how Israel is able, despite the fact that it is in the driest region in the world, despite the fact that it rains basically only from maybe um, October or November until March or sometimes until April, but that's about it. Despite the fact that Israel's population is the fastest rate of population growth in the world since it became a state in 1948, despite the fact that Israel's economy is a booming economy, which is usually a metric of of great amounts of water consumption, despite the fact that Israel is self-sufficient in fruits and vegetables and other forms of agriculture, 
despite all of that, despite all the reasons why Israel should be a water basket case, as most of its neighbors, in fact, all of its neighbors are, Israel, as, as you said, exports water. It's 60% of the water consumed by Palestinians in the West Bank comes from Israeli water sources. Kingdom of Jordan gets about 10% of its total water supplies, drinking water supplies from Israel. Even in Gaza, where there's a sworn enemy, where they have rockets coming out on a regular basis hitting Israel, Israel provides between 10 and 15% of the drinking water provided and consumed by Palestinians there. So it's, a, it's an amazing story. And, and I'll just go one step further. If you look around the world today, and I know this is somewhat of the mission of the AIFL, AI, but if you look around the world today at all the gravest problems, whether it's cybersecurity, terrorism, immigration, population flows, hunger, water scarcity, even COVID. Each and every one of these are places where Israel either leads the world in solution making or is among the leaders. And it would surprise nobody, even though Israel is a country of 9 million people, it would surprise nobody if the cure, if the solution for COVID were to come out of Israel. It may come out of America, it may come out of England, it may come out of another large, large country, but nobody would be shocked if this little country of 9 million people the size of the state of New Jersey were actually the home of the solution for this grave global problem. And that is because Israel is, does many things wonderfully, and one of which it does is it looks at problems that it has for itself, finds a solution for itself, and then exports those solutions around the world. And no better case is that told than the case of water. Oded, you want to jump in and, and share? Yeah. Look, I first learned about you, Oded, on page 151 of, of Seth's book. And uh, <laughs> I know the two of you uh, are not uh, new to this conversation, but also new to um, uh, really watching this remarkable story unfold. It's still unfolding. So uh, share a little bit when you were this uh, uh, young government official that, 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 that people were wondering about all these uh, highfalutin, high-tech ideas that you had, how did you take a bureaucracy uh, to embrace those and become part of uh, this, this real, um, frankly, it's a turnaround. It, you, you created a historical turnaround of a resource issue. Thanks, Wayne, and, and, and again, uh, from, uh, from my side also, I would like to, to thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity to uh, speak probably uh, of what I think is uh, one of the most important topics uh, uh, around the world. And uh, obviously, uh, I'm sure that uh, Seth uh, agrees with me. And this is why uh, it's not the first time that uh, we do this kind of a conversation. Usually, it has been done uh, face to face, but uh, COVID time, uh, so we're doing it uh, Zoom. But nevertheless, the, the issue itself is of a uh, major significance. And uh, I think the important, uh, uh, or, you know, if you, if you ask me what would you like to get out of this uh, one hour of conversation between uh, you two and, and the rest of the world, uh, is that for people to understand, one, how important is this topic and how crucial it is uh, for the general public, for the uh, entire uh, community, um, opinion leaders, politicians, operators, academics, uh, investors, and on and on and on, to understand the situation, uh, to realize that uh, business as usual is simply not, not an option anymore, and we have to, uh, to change the way things uh, are happening. And this is in the US and uh, uh, in, in so many other parts of the world, by the way, including Israel. Uh, the fact that, uh, uh, as uh, Seth mentioned, Israel is, is managing to overcome its water challenges does not mean that uh, we can uh, lay down and uh, just uh, relax. It's an ongoing uh, struggle, an ongoing uh, effort, uh, because we have to get uh, better all the time. Uh, the challenges are enormous. And uh, if you go over the... Uh, uh, SDGs the, uh, of the uh, uh, United Nations, the, uh, the uh, global uh, development goals. Development goals. You see that 
uh, out of the 17, at least 12 are directly connected to water, and probably the additional five are indirected, directly connected to water. So it is about uh, gender and equality, etc. that when you analyze it, you realize that in many aspects it is related to water, and obviously all the issues of uh, food security and the safe and clean environment and on and on and on are directly connected to water. So the challenge is, is enormous, it's huge. Uh, what, the point of what uh, I'm, I'm, I want to, to address is the fact that we want to, uh, to raise the awareness to this topic and to draw the best talent from uh, the entrepreneurial world or to draw the attention of politicians in order for, the, for people to understand that they have to make the necessary steps to move in order to address this challenge. The positive side is that uh, it can be addressed. In a way, the negative side is that it's going to be a big challenge because it involves so many aspects that uh, we'll, we'll try to touch it uh, during our conversation. But it's, worth, but it's worthwhile saying though that um water problems are unlike maybe other types of problems like say a tsunami or a typhoon or a, or a hurricane. Water problems give us the blessing of giving us a very long lead time. We know we're having this problem long before it hits us. And I mean, every so often that's not the case with a toxic element getting into our water or whatever, but put that aside. I mean, th that's the rare event. But we have gigantic yeah. global water problems. And that is because civil society, media, academia, polit politicians, bilateral, multilateral organizations have chosen to kick the can down the road. And, and there is nowhere in the world where this should be a problem. And that is, a, the, it, it, and again, not to reprise my book too much, but, but that's exactly what the first third of the book talks about. Israel saw in the 1920s, 100 years ago, that they were going to have a problem. This is before they were a country, they were under the control of the British. They saw in the 1920s that they were going to have a problem in a, in a handful of years if they didn't get on ahead of this problem. And so they did. They made it into a national concern. And think about this. The, prime, the ultimate third prime minister of the state of Israel, Levi Eshkol, was the founder of the National Water Utility. I mean, think about the importance that they, the, the, the breeding ground for leadership that they created around water. The future um, minister of finance was the co-founder of this water utility. And so think about, think about where else in the world you have such an emphasis on water needs. And so therefore, it's not a surprise that Israel has been such a success. Israel is not the only country in the world with smart people, with great entrepreneurs, with engineers and so forth. But what is special about Israel is that they don't duck and hide and, and try to kick every problem down the road. They say, we have a problem, we're going to have a problem, let's get ahead of it so that it doesn't become a problem. You know, I want to elaborate a little bit about this, this point because I think it is uh, uh, very important. The idea that uh, uh, from the very beginning, actually from before the, the country was established, before Israel was established, the founders of the country, the, the top leadership, of the, the Jewish people uh, in Israel identified water as a crucial element that they have to address. And uh, in his book, Yossi touches it deeply. Uh, Yossi, by the way, Yossi is my nickname. That's why Odette's calling me Yossi. Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Now, now we are clear that I can go on and speak to Yossi and that's it. So, Yossi investigated deeply about exactly what happened and the relations and the uh, disagreements between the, the, the founders of the country about what is the right policy in order to address the water challenges. Uh, and, and eventually they, they have managed. And we have a very sophisticated, uh, advanced water system that uh, obviously uh, will try to touch it a little bit and to describe it. But I want to say that a major difference compare, when you compare the Israeli story to many other places around the world is that water used to be a very local issue. 
So the small farm took care of its own water issues, the little village, maybe the small uh, industry, uh, and, and each one managed its own issue, water issues and wastewater. And since, you know, especially in the United States, you had plenty, plenty of space, plenty of water, everything was more or less okay. And, and in many cases around the world, it is more or less the same story. So water was not a issue that was dealt on a national level. And this is a major difference uh, between the Israeli case and uh, many other places around the world. And uh, we have to realize it nowadays when you say, okay, we cannot, uh, we can no longer manage water on a local or sectorial level. It has to be upgraded to a, a national level. And this is a very painful process. Uh, and, and people have to realize that there are going to be sacrifices. But at the end of the, uh, of the day, it has to be done because we are talking about a, a resource that is in a great need. And unless we manage it very smart and use water twice or three times in the same cycle, we simply don't have enough to support everything, to support nature, to support agriculture, to support domestic use, to support industry. Uh, but if we manage water in a smart way, it is definitely doable, especially in, in countries that are relatively blessed. Uh, so this is, I think, a, a, an important point, and uh, again, Yossi in his book touches it very, very deeply and, and makes a, a very clear point uh, there. You know, just for one more second, I'll let Wayne take it away again. But in that same period, the 1920s, when they decided to make water one of the national priorities, there were three priorities that they picked. I mean, obviously, healthcare was an issue, education was an issue, but those are not priorities. They picked three priorities, and there's not a surprise that today, 100 years later, Israel is a world leader in all three. The first was national security. This is before there was a country. They decided they will be self-sufficient. They will be able to defend themselves by themselves. Before the Holocaust, they realized that there was going to be, nobody was going to come to the aid of the Jews, and they were right. Number two is they decided to have a robust immigration policy. And number three was water. And today, Israel is, you know, despite its tiny size, Israel is a model for all three of the whole world. Seth, um, you know, when I asked before where people were calling in, I, I had uh, expected that we would get a wide range of, of people geographically, uh, certainly in the United States, the Long Island Sound, someone in West Hartford, Lake Victoria, Augusta, Georgia, Crystal Lake uh, in New England, um, uh, someone from Toronto near the Great Lakes, uh, near my house, Rock Creek Park, uh, not too far from here, my friend Tim. Uh, but also the- Tim Cohn, uh, hello Tim Cohn. Someone calling in from <laughs> Kuwait um, and um, mentioning uh, as a water source, the uh, uh, Arab Gulf. Uh, I know when we spoke earlier, talking about desalinization, one of the just worthy of its own book and its own chapter, but this is one of the sort of uh, um, uh, miracle stories coming out of Israel. And I know, Seth, you said that if we went to a certain place in California, we could find a very Israeli looking uh, uh, device that's helping create water from, uh, from saltwater ocean. Where, how, how close are we on this technology to being able to utilizing it for, for, uh, on, on, on a global scale or, or here in America? So first of all, I want to I want to welcome. Uh, where did you say this person was calling in from? Kuwait, did you say? Yes, yes. This is actually a loyal caller. We get we get a lot so, of so, calls. So through. so so if you will connect me to this person afterwards, I just want to say, as as Wayne said in the opening, the book is out in eighteen languages. It's coming out in Farsi uh, in a few uh, months. Um, the language of Iran. Um, the language that I would more than any other like to have it out in though is Arabic, and I'd like to make an offer to you, my friend in Kuwait. I will offer to give the rights to this book royalty free to any, uh, any publisher in the Arab world who's prepared to do an Arabic translation of this book and do the book in Arabic and with 
not only no no fee for me, I will donate dollar for dollar every penny of royalties that would be there to a local Arabic charity, because this is how important I believe this book needs to be read in the Arab world, not only so that they see a model for Israel, but because of the water scarcity in the Arab world. Water scarcity in the Arab world will become the gravest problem facing the uh, Islamic world, not just the Arab world, but the Islamic world writ large. As to your question, um, look, Israel believes the following about desalination, that the very wealthy countries, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and so forth, will be just fine ultimately because they can buy their way out of the problem. But there are great numbers of people in Egypt, uh, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and so forth in the Arab world, to say nothing of, of Iraq, which now is having water problems because the Tigris and Euphrates are being blocked by the Turks. So there's large, large, large water problems throughout the Arab world that are current and evolving. Um, Israel believes that desalination is a wise tool to use but it's the last resort tool that before you get to having to use desalination, which you need to do, but that you need to first develop a culture of conservation. You need to develop a system of reusing, as Oded talked about, reusing water for agriculture and for other purposes. And that you need to use market forces to encourage people to be intelligent about how they use their water and how they can use technology to replace water in ways that will make water use more efficient, such as the company that Oded works for right now, Talia has a device, and a very inexpensive device, that cuts the water use in, on uh, orchards, trees, by about half. And uh, it's, a, it's a very clever device, but there's many, many such devices, almost all of which come out of Israel. In terms of the, what you're talking about, the um, Carlsbad, California facility, the world's largest desalination facility, and not only largest, but most energy efficient, lowest cost per gallon of water, um, and least impact on uh, carbon fuel. The, the, the largest in the world is located in Israel, in Sorek, about a mile or so from the seashore. It's not an on the seashore desalination plant, which is, sounds bizarre, but it's true. Um, and the world's second largest desalination plant that is, has almost all the same attributes, is located in Carlsbad, California, or in the San Diego area, providing water for San Diego residents. And the reason why it is so similar is because it is built, designed and built by the same Israeli company that built Sorek, um, and it has the identical technologies uh, to be used. And this is a technology that is very energy efficient. Uh, and, and I predict, I predict in my book, and I predict now, that this is going to be the model for many places around the world that find themselves running out of water because it just is a scarcity problem. So, so Yossi, hey. uh, so, uh, Oded, um, while we're waiting for the price on desalinization to come down, there are a lot of poor countries out there. There are a lot of poor states. Uh, at the moment, our economy is not looking at major infrastructure investments. What are some of the things that poorer countries, poorer states, st uh, states that uh, need to begin conserving or creating a more sustainable path to water now, what are the things they can do if they can't make large capital investments in big de desalinization plants? So, you know, exactly like uh, uh, Yossi mentioned, uh, desalination is definitely uh, uh, a solution that is acceptable, but it has uh, a price. Price goes down. It was uh, uh, over uh, $1, maybe just uh, about 20, 25 years ago, and it is uh, around uh, 40 something cents uh, nowadays. So from something that uh, was considered kind of uh, science fiction, it's uh, already uh, something that is uh, usable. Oh, 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 dead, oh, dead, oh, dead, oh, dead. Hold one second, you're, scare you're scaring everybody by saying a dollar and 40 cents. We're not talking about no. forget. Not talking about for a gallon. We're talking about for two hundred and sixty-five gallons. That's right. We're talking about a different measurement. So for yeah, very, sorry, for a very Cubic meters for a very large amount of water, it went from about a dollar down to about forty something cents. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt you though. No, no, that's good. I uh, sometimes forget, you know, the the different measurements, and you're right. People can uh, get lost there. 
So the, the uh, price is, is con continuously uh, going down because uh, technology is improving and because energy efficiency is, in, is improving and uh, um, different companies, but especially uh, IDE that uh, was mentioned about Carlsbad and uh, the large projects uh, here in Israel, uh, is a very good, uh, reliable uh, company that is doing uh, those projects. And just to, to conclude this uh, uh, point about desalination, uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, most reliable source because we used to be very much dependent on nature in order to get uh, uh, enough uh, water uh, for our uh, total demand. And nowadays we can rely on desalination and can say, uh, we pray to get uh, a lot of uh, rain but if we don't, if we are not blessed with a good year, still uh, we are okay. Now, as we said, desalination is the last uh, resource because of uh, cost. So what can come before desalination? So obviously, first thing is don't lose water. And this is what happened uh, all over the world in uh, municipalities where uh, you lose water in your pipes, something between 25 up to around 80% of water is lost uh, due to poor maintenance and leaks and on and on and on. Uh, and there are plenty of brilliant... I think we may have a freeze from Oded. Uh, Seth, are you still with me? I am so with you, yes. So I can, Seth... Uh, I might be able to finish his thought. Go ahead. Okay. So, so, so the key thing is, is that before we get to using desalinated water, because it is expensive and not every country can do it, there are things that everyone can do. You can, you can first of all have a, a philosophy of conservation, so people just use less; they don't have to waste so much. I think Odette is back, so if he is, I'll let him continue. But Odette, yeah, are you back? Thanks. Okay, sure, of course. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for uh, backing me up. <laughs> So, you know, don't lose water in your, uh, in your systems all over the world. And again, if somebody is interested, we can uh, uh, go and elaborate on the different techniques there. It's, it's, it's fascinating because it involves uh, algorithms and, so, and, uh, so, and sonar and, and, and satellite and cool, cool stuff. Uh, another very important point is reuse water. Uh, and, and again, this is something that is more uh, an issue of, of a mindset, of a culture, because in many places you have wastewater treatment plants, you treat the water, and then the affluent, that it is basically clean water, is being released and not being used. In Israel, treated water, reused water, is the main source of water for irrigation in, in agriculture. And then another very important element is agriculture. And agriculture takes 70% of the total water consumption globally. Different countries, it varies. It goes from 60% up to 90%. But in any, any, any country, agriculture takes the majority of uh, the water pie. And usually agriculture is a very wasteful uh, sector that is using water, uh, I would say, not efficiently. And, and I use uh, soft words. Uh, drip irrigation is, is used very limited uh, around the world. And uh, uh, my, my company, Italia, we are dealing with agriculture and we are trying to improve dramatically water usage uh, in order to get better, more yield for every drop of water. Uh, there is another uh, very cool company called the uh, Endrip that is doing uh, advanced, um, cheapest, but more sophisticated uh, uh, method of, of uh, drip irrigation. And uh, by the way, uh, both companies are now in a pilot uh, in uh, New Mexico with the New Mexico State University. 
growing uh, pecans uh, in, in New Mexico. And uh, the idea is how can we convince the agriculture sector to use its uh, resources in a smarter uh, way. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a small uh, secret and anecdote uh, that I learned uh, from a visit that I uh, uh, had in India before, before COVID. And I realized that farmers in India over-irrigate, which is unbelievable, it's crazy. We're talking about India, a country that is suffering much more than the US, uh, probably like the most, uh, uh, the, the, the hardest uh, situation uh, around the world, where people do not have water. And still, the agriculture sector over irrigate. Why is it so? So one is because they don't pay. Water has no price, so farmers use it as much as they can. And they use it until they don't have water. It is as crazy as I describe it. And this is why addressing water challenges takes a very complex and a very sophisticated structure that involves all uh, players in the, in, in, in the sector in a specific uh, uh, region. Again, we actually had someone, um, uh, Diane uh, Newman, who wrote in that they uh, that she had worked in India, where the competition for clean water is very severe, uh, in her, yep. in in her at estimation. And I know that the competition piece and and figuring out how to create a public, um, uh, you know, a mar a market based. Uh, um, uh, value for water is, is a challenge that a lot of centralized governments um, uh, face. Are, are you seeing that something that there's progress on, or do you think that's still a stumbling block? Definitely still, still in a stumbling block, and uh, it takes a lot of courage from uh, top leadership politicians in order to step out and say, my dear citizens, uh, it doesn't work. The present situation doesn't work. You don't pay, but we do not supply to you anything. But by the way, in this case as well, Israel is a model because Israel, like everywhere else in the world, water was free for, agri for agriculture. Water was free. And lo and behold, they make a decision uh, some years ago to start charging first in, in, in cities. Uh, they spent four years phasing it in. They spent about eight years phasing it in for agriculture. And guess what? As soon as farmers had to pay for the, as, as water efficient as Israeli farmers were, once they had to pay for their water, suddenly they started using all kinds of new technologies to reduce their amount of water. They started, um, they started using alternative water, which is something I'd like to put up, if we can put our chart up on the, uh, uh, on the um, uh, Jonathan, if you can put that chart up that I gave you earlier. Uh, we have the opportunity to understand that Israel, um, what Israel does is um, that Israel makes very smart use of its water so that uh, if you can see, when people talk about how is Israel, the is water miracle, how is Israel able to do what it does? The answer is that only about 35 to 38% of its total water comes from what we'll call natural sources, so aquifers or the Sea of Galilee. But over 60% of it is manufactured water. And because of that, the amount of water that is used can be increased at will. You can just build another desalination plant or step up the amount of production. Now, sewage is somewhat capped because unlike the rest of the world where almost no sewage is reused, Israel uses 86% of its national sewage, reach, treats it to a very high level. Most of it could actually be used as drinking water, but they know psychologically people don't wanna do that. And so they take it and they use it for agriculture. And what happened was, and they charge less for sewage treated water because it's not the same as fresh water. But guess what happened? As soon as they started charging for water, farmers began discovering, wait, wait a second, you know what? Sewage treated water. <laughs> it gets me the same result and I get the same healthy crops and I'll use it. And there's such a competition for it that the price of sewage treated water keeps rising. So, so, so that that's really, you can take the chart off now, but that's really the secret to Israel's success is that it, it is in partnership with nature, 
but it doesn't rely upon nature for its water the way everywhere else in the world does. And that's why California is now in the situation that it's in where its groundwater has been depleted to such a horrible degree that we're now pumping, first of all, the pumping costs have gotten extremely expensive because you have to reach lower and lower down. But there are some places that are now 400 feet below uh, surface trying to pump water. And the lower you go, your audience may not know this, Wayne, but the lower you go, the more degraded the quality of the water gets. You start getting more arsenic, you start getting more contaminants. And so, and so your crops suffer from that. If you could have a better sustainable system whereby your depletion is slower because of the technologies that we've been talking about, all of a sudden you'll find yourself with a much healthier water supply. Yeah, what, what do I, I do? Oh, Dad, I know just, you, oh, go ahead. Just, just uh, uh, two more points on this issue of uh, uh, water reuse because uh, I think it's, it's one of the major, in a way, secrets that we, we tell everybody, but this is the main, uh, one of the main uh, techniques. Uh, yeah, that we use. Now, in addition to what uh, Yossi just uh, uh, mentioned, two more points. One is uh, when farmers use fresh water for irrigation, and this was the case in Israel until the uh, 60s or more or less, and, and a little bit further down, whenever we had a dry year, agriculture was the first sector to suffer. Makes sense. Now, when they use reused water, it is reliable. They can, they can plan their year, they know they are going to get this source of water. So from their point of view, it's a major advantage. Second issue, and this is where the government did a very smart move. When they cut allocations to farmers of fresh water, because we didn't have enough, and moved them to use uh, reuse water, the government supported financially and compensated, um, and anyway, the, the government uh, allocated financial resources to the farmers according to the cuts in uh, their allocations in order to improve efficiency. So they had a way to uh, uh, install drip irrigation, sensors, smart irrigation, and uh, uh, precision irrigation. And by that, this entire sector is uh, upgraded dramatically. So this was really one of my big takeaways when I first uh, read Seth's book, um, the significance of agriculture uh, as a you know, user of water. We had a couple of questions, one from uh, Ruth, um, in light of that, um, as you look at the global challenges of uh, uh, related issues, not specifically water, but of hunger, for example, um, how do you, see, is there a connection point? I know you started your presentation by talking about the different sustainable development goals uh, and uh, how they all have connections back uh, to water. Is there a, a, is there a possible bridge there that, that, that you know, can, can I address one, that? Can I address one that? ministry is not talking to another ministry, uh, perhaps. Let me let me address that, if I may. Um, the technologies that have come out of Israel in drip irrigation, and and I have to say, there's a small conflict because I'm I'm very careful that I never in public forums ever talk about specific Israeli companies because I don't want it to sound like I'm shilling for anybody. But I do want to say that I fell so, in, and I've never invested in any Israeli technologies for that reason. I fell so in love with one specific technology that <laughs> before it was even a company, I, I became an investor in it. I just love this technology. And it's, uh, it's a company that Oded mentioned earlier. Uh, I'm not gonna mention it just cause I'm, I'm, I'm careful about not sound like I'm, I'm shilling for anybody. But if anybody wants to contact me privately, I'll be glad to talk to you about it, but I don't wanna do it in a, in a recorded setting. And what's beautiful about this technology and why it's going to revolutionize agriculture, I believe, is because it achieves several different things all at once. And again, most of these people watching this are, are, are city dwellers. They don't know farms. But let me tell you what happens. Uh, nine, uh, uh, most of the world that is irrigated, 85% of that is irrigated by what's called flood irrigation. 4% is drip irrigation. 
um, and um, about 50, about 10% is, um, is when you're flying over, when we used to fly, flying over the United States, you see those big circles in the ground over the Midwest, that's called center pivot irrigation, and all the rest is flood irrigation. It's a technology that goes back to ancient Egypt, where you would flood the field, you'd wait for the crops to you know, suck up all the water it can, about 50, 60% of the water evaporates, you lose most of it, and you know, it's just, it's a terribly, intensely water consumptive uh, uh, approach. This new approach takes flood irrigated fields and uses drippers, and maybe uh, Jonathan, we can get that photo uh, number one uh, up there so people can know what a dripper line is. Um, and and it, it uses the same dripper technology that's used by sophisticated uh, uh, dripper comp. No, 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 that's the wrong one. That's the wrong one. That's, uh, sorry, you're, I, I'm looking at the one, the dripper line. I was told that that's number one. Okay, so, um, uh, but in any event, that, that's a nice picture of a desalination plant though. Uh, so uh, that's the first thing. So first of all, it saves between 50 and 60% of the water because 100, almost 100% of the water is consumed by the dripper, as which if we get to the photograph, I'll explain further. Second of all, because the plants are dripped the water and they get it in a very beautiful, okay? So you can see there's a dripper line there and at regular intervals, it drops a, a, it drops a droplet of water on the plant from the time it's just a tiny little seedling. And instead of flooding the plant, it dr gives these dripper amounts. Because it's dripped onto the plant, it provides less stress to the plant of going from too much water to too little water, which sort of like is waterboarding the plant in a sense. It exhausts the plant. When you do drip irrigation, the yield, Wayne, to your question and to the question I was asked by, uh, by your uh, audience, the, the, the plant responds to this better treatment and produces a yield of between 40 and 60% on average increased yield. There's one experiment done in Holland with a dripper line of strawberries that increased the yield by 250%. But that's not, as, as they say in those old TV come on ads, but that's not all, <laughs> there's more. <laughs> I'll throw in two more dripper lines for the same price, <laughs> but that's not all. Because it's drippered instead of flooded, in flood irrigated fields, what you do is, in rain irrigated fields, what you do is you over fertilize the field. The plant you know will absorb as much fertilizer as it needs, but, all the, but if you give too little fertilizer, the plant will not do well. So farmers routinely over fertilize their fields. Now, why is that a bad thing? It's a bad thing because when the winter rains come, the remaining fertilizer gets either drilled into the ground, into the groundwater, and it becomes highly toxic water, or worse, much worse, if the water gets then washed into a waterway, which then ultimately goes out, say, into the Gulf of Mexico, all that extra nitrate, all that extra phosphorus doesn't just evaporate, it goes somewhere, it goes into the water, it kills off fish. If you've ever heard of algal blooms, algal blooms are coming only from over fertilized fields. If ever any of you have heard of the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, which is the size of Texas, it's an area in the Gulf of Mexico where no plants can grow, where no fish can survive. It's exactly because the Mississippi River, all the farms that feed into the Mississippi River have been over fertilized and that water and that nitrates and phosphorus, phosphorus flows into the Gulf of Mexico and kills it off. So drip irrigation will not only produce water savings, produce more food for a hungry world, but will also have incredibly great environmental benefits, aside from other benefits that Oded mentioned before, gender benefits, women not having to carry water back and forth all day long and so forth. So Seth, when you started going to salesman's mode, I thought you were actually going to uh, uh, go somewhere else. Tell when, me where. Well, when I, I was growing up, there was a phrase uh, that said that you can't create water out of thin air. Ah, <laughs> uh, but you can. So, so tell, tell us a little about atmospheric water generation. Oh, Wayne, you must be a professional in the water world that does words flow so easily out of your tongue, uh, off your tongue. Yes, wow, you must, you must have known about atmospheric water generation for at least a day by now. <laughs> <laughs> so atmospheric water generation is, is, a, is a, the dream of dreams of the world forever which is it turns out that the air around us is saturated. And that's why when we exhale, if you exhale into a tissue or something, you see this vapor. The vapor that you're ex expelling 
is the moisture in the air that you're breathing in. And the air is always saturated. Um, the air is always saturated with water. The question is how much. Even in the Mojave Desert at 12 noon, about, about 18 to 20% of the content of the air you're breathing is actually water. At night, when the dew point average drops, and I have to get to the science of all that, but when the, at night when it gets wet, that's why when you wake up in the morning, every, the car is wet, your lawn is wet, all that stuff, everything is dew. What dew is, it's, it's the water that condenses on the dew point. So the, what that means is that night the air is intensely saturated, 80, 85%, it's getting if it's raining. I mean, it's still it's deeply saturated. So what atmospheric water generation does is it, it takes the moisture out of the air, it stores it overnight or during the day or whenever you do it, but it's most efficient to do it at night. It stores it and then you have enough water, drinking water, food preparation, sanitation, what have you, all the water, you, excuse me, you might need to use throughout the day from the atmosphere. This is an evolving technology very much out of Israel. Um, it's, there are a couple of U.S. companies doing the same thing. I hope they all succeed because this is going to be a technology. The topic of my second book, which we're not talking about today very much, is Troubled Water, What's Wrong with What We Drink. Troubled Water talks about how in the United States, nearly everybody's water is contaminated. We don't talk about it very much because politicians don't want to scare everybody, but it's true. And, um, oh, thank you. I didn't realize we had that cover. Uh, uh, Troubled Water, What's Wrong with What We Drink. Uh, it, it, it's a true story. The book came out just before COVID uh, crisis hit. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a true story about how, how and why our water is contaminated in America, what the EPA under every president, Trump, Clinton, uh, uh, Bush, Ford, everybody, no matter who the president has been, has done nothing to pr protect us and our water and how that came about and what we need to do to fix it. But one of the ways we can fix it is by using atmospheric water generation because that produces pure H2O. And, well, and, that, and that's a technology that will, I believe also is going to become a global technology just as drip irrigation has become. Uh, Oded, I know you had prepared a number of slides that we won't have uh, time to go through all of them, but I'm <laughs> yeah. wondering if uh, you have a favorite to uh, uh, show us the kind of, uh, smart things that governments and uh, both here in the United States and around the world could be doing, should be doing what you've learned from your experience in Israel? So, you know, what, what I want to describe, and, and please leave me uh, one minute at the end to, uh, to show the, uh, the, the Talia, the company that I'm uh, uh, running now, and, and the project that uh, we're doing in New Mexico. But, uh, generally, uh, you know, my main uh, message after spending so many years in the government and being involved in uh, and creating Israel New Tech and being in touch with so many ministries and organizations uh, is the following. Uh, uh, we cannot address water challenges unless it is a combined effort by different agencies inside the government. And when I was uh, in charge of Israel New Tech, when I was uh, uh, running it, we had uh, a, a constant uh, a connection with 11 different ministries, which is a huge challenge. And whoever uh, knows uh, governments here in the audience understand what does it mean when you say I'm uh, cooperating with 11 different uh, ministries and we are trying to come up with an agreed uh, program or mission. Uh, and I call it uh, ego engineering, which is a new profession, a very challenging one. And the idea is that uh, how can you create an atmosphere that the different partners can, can, can flow with you, can be part of your, this big puzzle. Uh, uh, because it is very, very easy to scare away different partners because you do not have real leverage on them. So unless you make them part of the organization and you can uh, uh, show them that one, you're not threatening their resources, their responsibilities, uh, uh, and they can only gain. And by that you can create this big uh, uh, group, this big puzzle that can 
start change this entire big picture and, and, and move it to the right direction. Um, so can we show the picture? Yes, can we? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I will uh, move very fast. By the, by the way, Seth, we got great props for showing and explaining drip irrigation in the photo that you showed. Yeah, I saw that a woman, Lynn Schwartz, just suggested that I be nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. And <laughs> and I, I, I've never, I, I mean, gosh, that's really exciting. Let's do it, baby. <laughs> well, I do think, <laughs> Seth, there have been a number of comments about um, this story not being the story that uh, 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 gets the kind of attention in the media and um, uh, that that uh, what and even in the financial pages in the Wall Street Journal, although I, I know you've written articles there, um, but but, uh, but I, what, I think part part of what we are hoping is that people will start telling the story. But I, indeed, I'd like to do that, but I don't want to step on uh, on Oded's Talia uh, moment. So let's 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 do that, and then I'd like to have a, a closing word or two. And I'd sure. like to address. I think it's Dahlia Frieder's question that she put in the chat line. I'd like to address that as well, if I may. I, I uh, I, I vote yes, uh, <laughs> and, and I think uh, Yossi is doing a remarkable job globally, uh, putting water in the center of attention. And uh, you know, we have a, 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 a wonderful ambassador, but we cannot uh, leave him alone there. We need as many people as possible being part of this uh, important mission. Uh, so just. You know, one minute speaking about Talia, what you see here is a, a young plantation. This is a pecan tree in uh, New Mexico. And this is the pilot that uh, we're doing with the University of New Mexico with Andrip, uh, which is uh, the cool company doing uh, advanced uh, irrigation, and Talia. Talia is this cute device that you see around the tree. And basically what we do is we create ideal microclimate to the root zone, which means that it's kind of a wound to the root zone, to the young trees. And we are working with, uh, with nature. So we are doing various things simultaneously. One, enhancing water usage, minimizing the usage of chemicals, so good for the environment mitigates uh, any radical temperature. Bottom line, the trees grow faster, bear fruits earlier, and save a lot of uh, hard work uh, to the farmer. So this is uh, Talia, a very small company. For me, it's a major uh, change moving from government to a small uh, company, but I love every minute of it. Well, we, we look forward to eating a lot of pecans from New Mexico. Uh, Seth, how can we be better ambassadors on this story? Okay, I'd like to say a couple of words. Uh, a couple of words, uh, and I have to. I, unfortunately, I have um, a, a, something I have to get to in seven minutes. Otherwise, I would be glad to stick around forever. First of all, is I uh, I'm very much appreciative of both Wayne and Oded uh, saying uh, what you've said. Both of you have long been leaders in communicating about Israel. Oded, in fact, was probably the first person who ever. I saw speak about water in Israel, and he's been a friend, a social friend. He's been to my home for dinner uh, at least once, I think twice. Uh, we get together when we're in each other's countries. Um, and so um, uh, it's been a great, uh, uh, great fruit of this mission, uh, developing such a warm and wonderful relationship as I have with Oded. Um, but I want to say that, um, that this is a story that needs to be told more widely. I want everyone to know that I do not accept royalties for uh, any of my books. I believe that this is a social mission. Uh, this is a public service that I'm engaged in. I spent years writing each of these two books and I don't take a penny of royalties. I've used the royalties from Let There Be Water to fund scholarships at Ben Gurion University, Tel Aviv University and the water sciences. I, uh, my wife and I use the royalties to fund the refitting of the water laboratory at uh, a university. Uh, we funded a Palestinian Israeli education, water education program with these royalties and many other activities like that. We funded the, uh, the building of a uh, reservoir for farmers in the Galilee. 
uh, and, and, and other, other types of activities like that. And likewise with the, the new book, uh, Troubled Water, I used the royalties there to fund um, drinking water remediation programs for Native American reservations and other worthwhile causes of that kind. I don't take one penny, I fund every, all the expenses myself and I, and I don't take even reimbursement of one penny. Um, but that said, I don't wanna do this by myself because no one person, even if you're Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or Donald Trump, no one person, you know, uh, I'm not putting them all in the same category, but I'm just saying they're famous people, but no one person who's famous alone, and I'm not nearly famous enough in that regard, can possibly tell the story. But what we can do is each of us can amplify the work of the other. And so this is what I do. I write books, I write articles from newspapers, uh, I, I give talks, I meet with groups, I meet with congressmen, I meet with senators, I meet with heads of state, I talk about these issues, and I want to ask each and every one of you to be not just involved, but I want you to be my partner. I'm glad to share my, co contact me, um, my website is, is www.sethmsegel, S-E-T-H-M, like Mary Siegel, S-I-E-G-E-L.com, or through Twitter on, I tweet all the time. Uh, so uh, direct message me through Twitter or just ask Wayne how to reach me directly. Uh, that's fine as well. And no. let's, let's do this together. If you, have, if you have a community that's interested in talking more about this, let's do this together. If there are friends of yours who you think would like to do this, if it's one friend, just buy the book on Amazon. If it's 10 or more friends, let me know and I will get you the absolutely cheapest royalty-free books you can get from my publisher and get the story out. It's an important story to tell because it's a story that isn't told. Um, the final thing I, I'd just like to say is uh, Dahlia Frieder puts the question out on the chat line as to why doesn't Israel use this um, as a, something of a sword? Why doesn't Israel use this technology um, to, to, in a sense, to withhold it from countries? And I, I wanna say that I get asked, I, I've given more than 350 public addresses since the COVID, I've spoken several dozen times to to different audiences. I've spoken at almost 50 universities now. Um, uh, very friendly reactions from students. I've never had a bad experience because I'm talking about solutions, not about politics. Uh, it's a very interesting, friendly way to talk about Israel. Um, and, and I'm asked this question nearly everywhere I go. Why doesn't Israel use it as a sword? And what I believe is that Israel is a liberal social democracy. And Israel, like every good democratic country, aspires to see everyone else in the world have the highest quality of living that they possibly can. And this is the reason why Israel provides water for the Palestinians and for the Jordanians, why Israel provides education for people in 110 countries around the world. Um, and this is why now finally countries around the world have found their way to Israel to open diplomatic relations in large part, many of them say because they want access to Israeli water technologies. So I think Israel has played this brilliantly, has played it morally in a humanitarian way, and this is something that we want to encourage, encourage the story about what Israel does, of course, but encourage others to understand that what Israel does in water, Israel does in one field after another. And water is a metaphor for the Israel that many of us know and all of us know maybe, and many of us certainly love. And I'll stop there. I hope, I hope there's about 100 plus people on this call. I hope, hope I get 100 plus emails in the next two hours. Well, Seth and Oded, um, in addition to the people on, on, on Zoom, we have people around the world on, on, on Facebook, and it will continue to see this over time. We couldn't agree more. This is a great way to show um, the fruit of our friendship. It's great that we create friendships between our two countries. It's even better when we do things that uh, uh, repair the world and, and, and help um, address uh, and what I love so much about the subtitle of this book, Israel's Solutions for a World Starved uh, World. Um, my favorite part of this book that's not technical, um, Seth, is, is the uh, children's songs that you uh, allude to in building the culture of a water conservation country that, that you Let point to in the very roots of the Israeli uh, a, a approach to water conservation. So I think both Oded and, and, and Seth would be very proud to know that uh, before we were on this webinar, as many are on multiple webinars, we were on with a group of 10 and 12 year olds because this week American Israel Friendship League launched a uh, friendship program during this period of COVID uh, with a virtual exchange and a program on a daily basis with Israeli and American young kids and they were singing this morning and I was thinking about the uh, 
maybe we can get that the, uh, uh, the, the, the song you mentioned in the book into one of their future programs. For those of you that happen to have 10 or 12 year olds or no 10 or 12, 12 year olds, please have them take a look, uh, them or their parents take a look at our website. The program is called Betweens and uh, it is specifically aimed at, at children in Israel and the United States uh, between the ages of, of 10 and 12. And we will have a full launch this coming Monday, the 27th, uh, and people are able to register on the AIFL website. On, on a final program note, for those of you that are not between the ages of 10 and 12 and would like to join us on our regular program this coming Sunday, uh, Sunday the 26th at noon, we're doing a program from Chicago and Los Angeles called Dueling Delis. That's right, uh, 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 it's a, a, a duel between Manny's Deli in Chicago and Canner's Deli in LA. And we have a, a special guest star panelist, Jeff Garland from Curb Your Enthusiasm is, enjoy, is joining us on this panel to discuss everything you wanna know about pastrami, pickles, and uh, the best uh, schmear that you can find uh, at, at a deli. Uh, we have friends weighing in from, uh, from New York with uh, their New York deli stories. And so we invite everyone to be a part of that more lighthearted fair this coming weekend. But for all of it, you need water. It's summer, have your water bottles around. Oded, Seth, thank you for a, a fascinating discussion to all friends of Israel around the United States and around the world. Have a safe week. We're thrilled that you could join us today, and we will send copies of this and links for this for those of you that want to share it with others. Thanks, everybody, from all our friends here. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.